Stories of Old Greece and Rome, Part 2. Link to Part 1 is in the description. The Story of Diana During the childhood of Apollo and Diana, the goddess Latona lived happily on the island of Delos, and forgot all her early misfortunes in the joy of her children. As they grew up, she boasted of their strength and beauty to all who came to the shores of Delos, and no village or hamlet, however small, but had heard of Latona's children. When Grecian mothers put their little ones to bed at night, they told of wonderful tales of an island far out at sea, where a brother and sister lived who were fairer than all the flowers in the meadows and maidens, sighing for a loveliness greater than their own, wove garlands to adore the shrines of those who walked the earth in their immortal grace. Latona was proud of her children's fame, and boasted of it far and wide. Few mothers cared to dispute her claim, and these spoke only in whispers. But there was one bolder than the rest, who openly laughed at the goddess's boast, and taunted her with having but two such children with whom she could praise. This was Niobe, a Grecian princess and the mother of fourteen children, seven daughters and seven sons, all of them fair and strong in godlike in spite of their mortal birth. When Niobe learned that the people in her kingdom were loud in their praises of Latona's children, and were neglecting to honour her own splendid sons and daughters, she was very angry, and ordered all the statues of Apollo and Diana to be immediately destroyed. For the people, in their devotion to beauty, had set up many in the temples and the marketplace. Then she bade a messenger go tell the goddess what had been done, and show her in what contempt the mother of fourteen children held her who had but two. When Latona received the message, she was so enraged at the insult that her desire for revenge was boundless. So she called Apollo and Diana to her side, and commanded them to go forth and slay the children of Niobe. It was easy for Apollo to accomplish his part of the cruel task, for he met the seven sons of Niobe hunting, and slew them so quickly that not one of the brothers had time to ask what he had done to merit the gods' wrath. The daughters of Niobe were in the palace with their mother, but this did not daunt the young Diana, who put seven sharp arrows in her quiver, and, bow in hand, went forth to complete Latona's cold revenge. She found the maiden seated in Niobe's side, weaving, and one by one the remorseless goddess shot them down, in spite of their mother's heart-broken cries for mercy. Following that, her entreaties were in vain, and seeing six of her daughters lying dead beside her, the distracted Niobe sought to shield the remaining one with her own body, while she prayed wildly to the gods to spare her but this one child but the gods were deaf to her pleas, and Diana, fitting the final arrow to her bow, shot the maiden as she cowered in her mother's arms. Over her fallen body, the wretched Niobe wept so long that the gods at last felt pity for her grief and changed her into stone. This statue was placed by a running stream, 
and ever afterwards the waters were fed by the tears that continued to course down the cheeks of the stone image. And travellers came from foreign lands to gaze on this marvel of a devoted mother, who could not cease from mourning for her children, even when turned to stone. Though the goddess Diana spent most of her daylight hours in hunting, it was not often that she exercised her skill to such cruel purpose as was shown in the case of poor Niobe. Wherever the wild deer roamed, and the pathless forest knew no touch of woodman's axe, there Diana, fleet-footed and tireless, followed the chase. As soon as the flaming chariot of the sun drew its first streak of light across the hills, the goddess donned her short tunic, and armed with her golden bow and quiver, set out with her band of nymphs for the day's hunt. At noontide, wearied with the chase, she sought out some secluded spot where the mountain stream ran clear, and where the foliage hung round her like a curtain. On a certain day, when she and her maidens were enjoying the refreshing coolness of the water, they heard a slight rustle come from the trees, and looking around, perceived a young hunter who was watching them. It was Arcteon, who had himself been following the deer since daybreak, and had been drawn to this spot by the noise of running water. As he neared the stream, he heard the sounds of girlish laughter, and this so roused his curiosity that he hastily put aside the branches to see who the merrymakers might be. Great was his dismay, when he recognized Diana and her nymphs. But before he could disappear among the bushes, the goddess saw him, and, catching some water in her hand, she threw it into his face, crying, Go now, if you can, and say that you have seen Diana at her bath. The moment those words were spoken, Arcteon felt a queer change coming over him, and he stared in horror at his hands and feet, which were becoming hoofs, and his skin, which was rapidly changing into a deer's hide. Antlers grew out of his head, he dropped on all fours, and found himself turned into a stag. Before he quite realized what had befallen him, he had heard the baying of hounds, and knew that his only safety was in retreat. He dashed off through the bushes, but the dogs were on his track. Before he had gone far, the pack had overtaken him, since he knew no lore of the wild things by which they elude their enemies, and were snapping and snarling at his throat. Deprived of his human voice, he could not cry for help, and in a moment the hounds had torn him to pieces. So was Diana avenged. There was another young hunter who encountered Diana and her maidens out there in the woods, but he met a kinder fate at the hands of the goddess than did the poor Acteon, whose only fault had been a most natural curiosity. The fleet-footed Diana was no more ardent in the chase than was the hunter Orion, who roamed the forest all day with his faithful dog, who was called Sirius. One morning, as he rushed eagerly through the woods in pursuit of deer, he came suddenly upon the seven Pleiades, the nymphs of Diana who were resting after a long and arduous hunt that began at daybreak. Charmed with their beauty, Orion drew nearer, but the maidens, terrified at his outstretched arms, 
led away through the forest. Undaunted by the remembrance of Atheon's fate, the hunter pursued the flying nymphs, determined that so much beauty should not escape him. Seeing that he was gaining on them, in spite of their swift pace, the maidens called upon Diana for help, and were at once changed into seven white pigeons which flew up into the heavens before Orion's astonished eyes. Some time later, these same Pleiades became seven bright stars, and were set as a constellation in the sky, and they have remained there ever since. Orion continued to hunt from early dawn until nightfall, without any misfortune, overtaking him on account of his impetuous love-making. On the contrary, his ardor evidently found favor with the goddess Diana, for one day, when he unexpectedly met her alone in the forest, she smiled upon him graciously, and offered to share the day's sport with him. Perhaps it was the beauty of the young hunter, as well as his boldness, that charmed the goddess. But, however that may be, she continued to meet him in the forest, and they hunted together, hour after hour, until the twilight began to fall. Then Diana knew that she must leave her lover and mount her silver moon car. When Apollo learned of his sister's affection for the young hunter, he was very angry, for Diana had refused the love of the gods, and had begged of Jupiter the right to live unwed. The sun god determined, therefore, to put an end to Orion. So he waited at the shadowy portals of the west, until Diana, her nightly journey over, descended from her silver cart, and threw the reins on the necks of her wearied steeds. Then Apollo spoke to his sister of her hunting, and praised her skill with the bow. Presently, he pointed to a tiny speck that was rising and falling on the crest of the waves a long distance away, and bidding her use of this as a target, he challenged her to prove his skill. Diana, suspecting no treachery, fitted an arrow into her bow, and let it fly with unerring aim. Great was her distress when she discovered her brother's trickery, for it was no floating log or bit of seaweed the arrow had pierced, but Orion himself. Apollo had seen the hunter go each morning to the ocean to bathe, and he thought this was an easy way to dispose of the unworthy mortal lover. Diana mourned for Orion many days, and to keep his memory honored, she placed him and this faithful dog, Sirius, in the sky as the brightest constellations. The Story of Endymion The chaste Diana was not only a famous huntress, but she was a goddess of the moon as well. By day she roamed the forest with her band of nymphs, and by night she sailed in her bright moon chariot across the star-strewn sky, and looked down at the sleeping earth lying in the shadow, except where her soft light fell. As soon as Apollo had driven his tired, foam-flecked horses within the western gates, and twilight had begun to creep over the hills, Diana mounted her silver chariot, drawn by the milk-white steeds, and started on her nightly journey. During the first hours of her ride, the friendly twilight kept a faint glow in the heavens, and the road lay plain before her. But as night came on, and the blackness deepened, 
her horses might have wandered from their accustomed path, had not the stars wakened from their day-dreaming, and come out in great luminous clusters to light the goddess upon her way. Though the journey was always the same, night after night, Diana never wearied of her course, or found the sleeping earth less lovely, as it unfolded hour by hour before her eyes. One evening, as she looked down upon the quiet scene, she found the form of a shepherd boy lying upon a grassy hilltop, where the moonlight shone full upon his upturned face. Diana was not susceptible to love, but when she saw Endymion sleeping, she marveled at his beauty, and felt a strange longing to be near him. So she stepped softly from her silver chariot and floated down to the earth, to the spot where the unconscious shepherd lay dreaming. There was the perfect stillness all around, and no whisper came but the soft murmur from the pine trees, which sounded like some great creature sighing in its sleep. For some time the goddess watched the youth in silence, then, stooping, she gently kissed him. Endymion half wakened at her touch, and looked sleepily around, bewildered by the radiance that seemed to be enfolding him in its unearthly light. But in a moment the glory had faded away, and there was only the deep blueness of the night all about him. For Diana, frightened at her own boldness, had hurried back to her silver chariot and sped away into the darkness. Endymion thought then that he had dreamed a dream of some beautiful form that had lingered by his side, and although he awaited patiently and hopefully all through the night, he saw no other vision, and only the dawn came to greet his weary eyes. The next night Diana drove her milk-white horses impatiently, and often at random, until the quiet stars, as they watched her restless course, wondered and felt half afraid. When the clouds wrapped her closely in their white embrace, the goddess drove them angrily aside, lest they shut out from her eyes the sight of the sleeping earth. At last she drew near the hillside where the lovely Endymion lay, and on seeing him there, Diana glided again from her silver chariot and stood beside his unconscious form. At her light touch he stirred and tried to rouse himself from his heavy slumber, but some spell seemed to bind his eyelids, and through sleep-dimmed eyes he saw the radiance fade away. Night after night he felt the presence of that bright being whom his eyes so longed to behold. But only in his dreams could he see her face or touch her floating garments that passed by him like the rustle of the night wind. Each night Diana lay her restless horses to stand unwatched among the shifting clouds. While she lingered on, the earth to gaze upon the sleeping shepherd boy, and as she stood beside him she wished that he might always be as now ever beautiful and ever young. So, to keep him untouched by sickness or sorrow or death, she took him to Mount Latmus, where there was a cave dedicated in her honour which no mortal foot had ever profaned. Here she placed Endymion, and caused an eternal sleep to fall upon him, so that his body, in all its youth and beauty, might never know decay. And every night, when her long journey was at an end, 
and the watchful stars had withdrawn their shining, Diana hastened to the lonely cave on Mount Latmus, there to linger beside Endymion sleeping, and touch him with a kiss that could not waken. The Story of Mercury Mercury was the son of Jupiter and Maia, the goddess of the plains, and from the day of his birth he was a most remarkable infant, even for a god. When scarcely a day old he sprang from his mother's arms and ran some distance off to where a tortoise shell was lying on the ground. Picking this up, he bored holes in its side, stretched strings across it, and began to play. Thus, it was the first lyre that was made. Proud of this beginning to his day's adventures, Mercury ran away again toward evening. When his mother was sleeping, he roamed about the fragrant meadows where Apollo kept his herd of cattle. The pasturage was rich, and the oxen were fat, and the mischievous young god, only a day old, decided to have a few of them for his dinner. He took fifty of the herd, and tied branches of leaves to their feet, so that their hoofs might leave no print on the smooth turf, and drove them to a quiet spot far away from the meadow. Here he killed and ate two of the oxen, and kept the rest in hiding for another day's feast. There he hurried back to his mother, who had not yet awakened. When Apollo found late that evening that fifty of his cattle had gone missing, he searched, but he could not find them. As he was about to give them up as lost, he remembered that a son had lately been born to Jupiter, whom the divine ruler had appointed to be the god of thieves. Suspecting that his stolen oxen were in the hands of this master thief, Apollo hastened to where Maia and the babe were sleeping. Rousing the child angrily, the irate god accused him of the theft, but Mercury protested his innocence and asked, how could an infant but a day old ever do such an unheard of thing? Apollo was unconvinced, however, by this appearance of candor, and feeling sure of the boy's guilt, dragged him off to Olympus, where Mercury found it impossible to pretend any longer that he knew nothing of the missing oxen. He acknowledged his thievery, showed Apollo the hiding place of the stolen cattle, and in return for those he had eaten, gave the sun god his wonderful new lyre. This gift so delighted Apollo that he presented the day-old prince of thieves with a magic wand, which, when held between any who were quarrelling, would cause all anger and strife to cease. To test the value of the wand, Mercury thrust it between two snakes which were struggling over the possession of a wounded bird, and immediately they twined themselves around the staff, and remained coiled together in perfect friendliness. This pleased Mercury so much that he bade them stay there forever, so long as the wand last. There were two other valuable gifts that the gods gave to the young Mercury, a winged cap and a pair of winged sandals, so that, as the messenger of the gods, he might be fleet of foot on his many errands to and from Olympus. Among the very duties assigned to Mercury was that of conducting the souls of the dead to take to Hades, but this did not occupy all the gods' time, and he still had many hours in which to go on other missions, in spite of his rather doubtful reputation for honesty.
the gods often sought his assistance in their difficulties. And in one very delicate commission, he proved himself to be a competent ally. This was when Jupiter went wooing the maiden, Io. The jealous and vengeful Juno was always on the watch whenever her lord took a fancy to go wandering about the earth. So to woo the gentle Io unseen by his wife required some diplomacy on Jupiter's part. Accordingly, he spread a thick cloud over the meadow where he was wont to meet the maiden, and trusted that its appearance would not arouse Juno's suspicions. He also took the precaution to visit Io at the time when the watchful queen of heaven was accustomed to sleep. But one day, Juno awoke sooner than usual, and finding that Jupiter was absent, she at once surmised that he was adventuring again in some sordid love affair. When she looked down upon the earth, she saw the thick cloud that hung over the meadow, and noticed that it never altered its position, no matter how the winds blew. Feeling sure that this was some trick intended to deceive her, the wrathful goddess glided down to earth and appeared at the astonished Jupiter's side. But not before he had time to change Io into a heifer. golden sandal Juno walked about the meadow gathering flowers. Then she asked her husband, why was he lingering there, so far from bright Olympus? Jupiter answered, that he was amusing himself by creating a heifer. This explanation did not deceive Juno, but she pretended to be satisfied, and she praised the beautiful creature's glossy skin and large soft eyes. Then she demanded it of Jupiter as a gift, and the ruler of the gods, not knowing how to refuse, consented. The triumphant goddess led away the heifer and put her in charge of Argus. Now Argus had a hundred eyes, and though he often went to sleep, some of his eyes always kept awake. So Juno felt sure that no device of Jupiter's could enable Io to escape from the watchful guardian, who never slept completely. Meanwhile, Jupiter was in despair over this unhappy ending and sought the help of Mercury, who often lent his ready wits to gods and mortals in distress. Laying aside his cap and sandals, and the snake-entwined wand, by which he might easily be recognized, Mercury went down to the earth, in the disguise of a shepherd. With his pipes in his hand, he strolled through the country, until he came to the mountainside, where Argus sat watching the heifer. And when he began to play, the music was so sweet that Argus begged him to stop a while, that he might listen longer to the wonderful playing. The god consented, and as he played on, some of the hundred eyes grew drowsy with sleep, but some of them stayed open and watchful. The droning of the pipes kept on and on, and to add to the drowsiness of the music, Mercury began to tell stories in a low sing-song tone that began to cast a kind of spell over the eyes that were still watching. He told of Apollo's affection for the youth Hyacinthus, whom Zephyrus, the god of the west wind, also loved, and how, when the sun-god was playing with his friend, Zephyrus, in a fit of jealous anger, blew aside the missile hurled by Apollo, so that it struck Hyacinthus and killed him. But the sun-god would not let the fair youth be forgotten, and changed each drop of his blood into delicate white flowers, which were forever to bear his name 
Then Mercury told Aesculapius, the son of Apollo and Coronis, who was entrusted to the care of Chiron, the most famous of the centaurs, and was also taught by his divine parent the art of healing. In this he became so skillful that even restored the dead to life, and so incurred the wrath of Jupiter, who, fearing that Aesculapius would receive undue honor, killed him with a thunderbolt. To these stories Mercury added many more that told of the loves of the gods, and that at last all the hundred eyes of Argus were finally closed. Then Mercury, drawing a sharp sword, cut off the great head as it drooped forward, and rolled it down the rocks. When Juno heard of the death of her faithful servant, she was terribly angry, and vowed that she would bring punishment on those who had been the cause of his slaying. But before doing this, she commemorated the fidelity of Argus, by taking his hundred eyes and putting them in the tail of her favorite bird, the peacock. Then she carried out her revenge by sending an enormous gadfly to torment poor Io, who was still in the form of a heifer. From one country to another the unhappy creature wandered, and once, in a desperate effort to escape her tormentor, she plunged into the sea which was afterwards called Ionian in her honor. Across this she swam and reached the shores of Africa, but even here the gadfly followed her, and the vengeance of Juno never allowed her a moment's rest. Jupiter could do nothing to ease her sufferings by interceding for her to the remorseless queen of heaven. But at last... Juno consented to send the gadfly away, and to restore Io to her own form, if Jupiter would promise never to visit her again. Reluctantly, the ruler of the gods agreed to this demand, and Io once more became a beautiful maiden. When Jupiter went wandering on the earth in search of adventures other than the wooing of some maiden, he often made Mercury his companion, for this slender young god was his favorite among all the dwellers of Olympus. One day, both the gods, disguised as travelers, stopped at the hut of an aged couple named Philemon and Baucis, and, pretending weariness, they asked to be allowed to rest for a while. Well, the old couple were delighted that strangers had honored their humble roof, and in order to extend hospitality still further, Philemon decided to kill the one thing he had that could furnish meat for the guests. This was a large, fat goose, who had no mind to be killed and eaten, even to supply a meal for gods. So when the old men tried to catch him, he sought refuge between Jupiter's knees. When the ruler of the gods learned that the couple intended to sacrifice their one possession, he was greatly touched by their kindness, but would not allow them to kill the trusting bird that had fled to him for protection. And then the good wife, Balchus, sent before her guests olives and cornel berries preserved in vinegar and cheese and eggs cooked in the ashes. She laid earthen cups and dishes on the table, which she had already rubbed with sweet-smelling herbs, and placed beside them an earthen pitcher filled with their best wine. While a simple meal was going on, and the guests were partaking of a dessert of apples and wild honey, Balkus was so fluttered over her duties as a hostess that she did not observe the pitcher. But old Philemon looked on in astonishment, 
at the wine which renewed itself as fast as it was poured out. He whispered to his wife to watch this miracle, and when she too saw the never-empty pitcher, she was filled with a vague terror, and looked fearfully at the smiling strangers. So Jupiter told the old man and his wife, who their guests really were, and bade them to ask for some wish, swearing by the terrible river Styx to grant whatever they might desire. Then Philemon and Baucus begged that they might be allowed to serve the gods as long as they lived, and that when their time of service was over, that they may peacefully pass away together. Pleased with the simplicity of this request, Jupiter gladly promised that all should be as they wished, and he transformed their humble cottage into a beautiful temple, where they might worship the gods all their days. And when after years of faithful service Philemon and Baucus died, Jupiter changed them into lordly oaks, which stood before the pillars of the temple as a monument to their fidelity. The Story of Aphrodite or Venus Once the stately Juno looked down from high peak Olympus and saw Jupiter walking in a meadow with a maiden so exquisitely fair that the flowers fell at her feet, looked dull and faded beside her dazzling whiteness. This was Callisto, so famous for her beauty, that suitors came from distant lands to woo her, but she cared nothing for their rich gifts, nor would she listen to any vows of love. Then Jupiter sought her, as she wandered alone in the meadow, and the maiden gladly yielded to the great ruler of the gods the love that no mortal man had been able to win. When white-armed Juno learned how many hours Jupiter spent by the side of Callisto, she determined to punish the helpless maiden, and accordingly turned her into a bear. For a long time Jupiter sought her in the familiar meadow, but she never came again to meet him. Then one day he found her in the forest with her little son Arcas, both turned into bears by the jealous hate of Juno. Grieved as he was at this misfortune, the ruler of Olympus, could not restore them to their human form, but he took them to the heavens, that they might suffer no further harm, and placed them in the sky as the constellations of the great and little bear. Jupiter often assumed the form of a bird or animal, so as to escape Juno's watchful eyes. As a swan, he won the love of Leda, and their child was the fair-haired Helen, whose beauty cost the men of Troy so dearly. As a white bull, he wooed the gentle maid Europa, who was frightened at his sudden appearance in the meadow where she was playing. But as soon as she saw how tame and beautiful the animal was, and how anxious to be petted, she lost all of her fear. She made a wreath of flowers, to hang about his neck, and grew so accustomed to her new playmate that she got upon his back as he bent his lordly head to receive her garlands. The bull then galloped away toward the sea, and before the terrified girl could realize what had happened, he plunged her into the waves. As soon as they were far from the land, the white bull spoke gently to Europa, and told her who he really was, and how, for the love of her, he had assumed this strange disguise. So the maiden was no longer afraid, but allowed herself to be carried to an unknown land that was afterward called Europe in her honour. <laughs>
It was no wonder that Juno kept watch over the earth, as no other goddess needed to do, for she knew that the loveliness that belonged to the daughters of men could easily lure the great Jupiter from his golden throne. She was therefore quite reasonably angry when she looked one day through the white clouds around Olympus and saw, not on the earth, but in the lap of the ever-tossing sea, the most beautiful being that could exist outside of a dream. So wonderfully fair was this maiden upon whom Juno fixed her resentful gaze, that she seemed too perfect to be made of flesh and blood, and the jealous watcher was almost persuaded that it was no real living thing which rested softly on the crest of the waves, but some creature made from the rainbow colours of the white mist of the sea. The ocean rocked her lightly on its breast, and Zephyrus, the west wind, bore her gently toward the shore. The sunlight shone on her rosy flesh, and her long hair lay out upon the waves, glistening like the spun gold. The sky above her was not more soft or deep than the blueness of her eyes, and the smile upon her perfect lips was of a subtle sweetness, more alluring than the breath of spring. As she laid pillowed in the arms of the slow-swinging sea, the west wind bore her to the island of Cyprus, and when her foot touched the warm sand, the goddess rose from the waves, which were so loath to yield her to the waiting earth, and stepped lightly upon the shore. She flung the wet ringlets from her forehead, shook the foam from her breast and shoulders, white as the purest marble, and stood upright in the warm sunshine, the most perfect thing that the wandering old earth had ever looked upon. This was Venus, the goddess of love and beauty, born of the foam of the sea, and destined to be the most far-famed of all the dwellers in Olympus. It was not long before others than the watchful Juno had seen this vision of loveliness, and she was eagerly welcomed by the gods as soon as she appeared among them. The beauty and grace of the new goddess so charmed them that all were eager to yield to her homage and she was immediately sought in marriage, even Jupiter himself becoming an enamoured suitor. But laughter-loving Venus refused to be wed, and would not listen to any wooing. And then the ruler of the gods, finding his proffered love scorned by the proud goddess, determined to punish her by compelling her to marry Vulcan, the ugliest and most ill-favoured of the deities. And as Jupiter's law was word in all of the universe, Venus was obliged to obey. But, though married, she was by no means a devoted or faithful wife, and she caused poor Vulcan many unhappy moments for he saw his misshapen re form repelled her, and he knew that she would soon seek for happiness elsewhere. The first to win the love of the golden Venus was Mars, the handsome god of war, who, though delighted at being honoured as the chosen one of beauty, was careful that the goddess's preference should not be known. When he and Venus met in some lover's bower, they placed Electrion, the attendant of Mars, on guard, so that no one, not even prying Juno, would become aware of them. Things went on happily for some time, but one day Electrion fell asleep at his post, 
and slept so soundly that he did not see Apollo in his golden chariot, driving close to the place of the lovers. When the sun god realized what was happening, he went straight away to Vulcan and told him how much his wife was enjoying the society of Mars. Vulcan, ashamed and angry, set to work to forge a net linked of steel, and when it was finished he hurried with it to the spot where Venus and the god of war were still conversing together. Stepping up softly behind them, Vulcan drew the net over their heads, and thus held them fast. Then he hastened back to Olympus, where he told his story and bade all the gods to go look upon the ridiculous and humiliating plight of the imprisoned lovers. When the captured pair were finally set free, Mars rushed off to find Electrion and to learn why they had not been warned of Apollo's approach. Finding his sentinel peacefully sleeping, unaware of the disaster that had occurred through his neglect of duty, Mars was so enraged that he changed Electron into a rooster and commanded him to rise early every morning and crow to announce the coming of the sun. The next fancy of Venus was for Adonis, a handsome young hunter, who was so fearless in his pursuit of game that the goddess often felt anxious for his safety. She urged him to give up the chase and spend all of his day with her. But however much Adonis enjoyed the society of Venus, he also loved to roam the forests, and no entities could induce him to give up his favorite sport. One day Adonis was following a wild boar, and believing that the creature was wounded, he boldly drew near. When the boar turned suddenly upon him and drove his long tusks into the youth's side. As he lay dying in the forest, Venus heard of the tragic ending of the day's hunt and hurried to save him. So careless was she of her own hurt that she rushed heedlessly through briars which tore her soft skin and scattered drops of blood on the white wood flowers. When she reached Adonis, he was already past her help and could not respond to her touch. Holding his lifeless body in her arms, Venus wept and mourned for her beloved, and her tears as they fell upon the sympathizing earth were changed into anemones. Then to hide from her eyes the painful sight of the young hunter's mangled body, the kindly earth again took pity on her grief and turned the drops of blood that came from Adonis's side into red roses. Still, the goddess would not be comforted, but sat mourning, alone with her dead. Then Mercury came to lead the soul of Adonis to the gloomy Hades, and when the messenger of the gods had departed with his slight burden, Venus went back to Olympus, and, throwing herself on the ground before Jupiter's throne, she besought him to give Adonis back to her, or else to allow her to stay with him in Hades. Since the world could not well spare the goddess of beauty, Jupiter refused to let her go to the sunless realms of Pluto, but neither would that dread ruler consent to give up Adonis to her longing arms. Then the gods, touched by the depth of Venus's grief, interceded in her behalf, and reluctantly Pluto then agreed to allow Adonis to spend six months with the goddess in the warmth and joy of the sunlight if, for the rest of the year, he would be content to dwell in Hades. Another one of the fortunates who 
gained the love of Venus was Anchises, the prince of Troy. But though the goddess lavished much attention upon him, she was rather ashamed of her attachment, for Anchises was only of mortal birth. She therefore bade him to keep the matter a secret, and for a time Anchises obeyed. But being proud of his relation to the goddess, he forgot his instructions, and boasted of his good fortune. This so angered the willful Venus that she never bestowed her favours on him again, but transferred all of her affection to her son Aeneas, who fared better at her hands than his father Angese. In the many adventures that befell the famous hero, Venus was always a ready protectress, and whenever Aeneas was involved in some apparently hopeless situation, his mother goddess would immediately hide him in a thick mist, which was sure to confuse his enemies. Sometimes, as in the Trojan War, she wrapped him in her shining robe, and bore him from the battlefield, and if the hero was constantly in tears as the Virgil, as the poet Virgil says, it was certainly not the fault of Venus. As to the ultimate fate of Anchise, well, some authorities say that the offended goddess borrowed one of Jupiter's thunderbolts and disposed of her talkative lover in this fashion. But the most probable story is that he lived to see Aeneas become a famous prince of Troy, and was himself carried from the ruins of that burning city on the shoulders of his devoted son. The Story of Cupid and Psyche Cupid, the god of love, was the son of Mars and Venus, and though he was always the happiest of children, his mother was distressed because he never grew up, but remained year after year a chubby, dimpled child. When she consulted Themis, the goddess of justice, to find out why Cupid was never any older, she was told that love cannot grow without passion. This explanation was at first very mystifying, but later, when Anteros was born, Venus understood the meaning of the strange words. Cupid then developed into a tall, slender youth, who did not revert to his childish form except in his brother's absence, when he again became a rosy and mischievous child. Though grown larger in stature, the god of love still kept his gauzy wings, and always carried a bow and a quiver full of arrows. No mortal ever saw him, though many knew when he had come and gone. But should any one be touched by a shaft sent carelessly from Cupid's golden bow, he was henceforth a slave to the slender winged god who bore lightly in his hand so much of human happiness and misery. There was once a king who had three daughters, with beauty famed far and wide, but the loveliness of their youngest was so great that people called her the goddess of beauty and worshipped her with offerings of flowers. The maiden, Psyche, was troubled over all this adoration, and begged for her followers to cease from their mad worship, for she knew that Venus would be sure to punish the one who usurped her title, and received the homage due only to an immortal. The people continued, however, to call Psyche the goddess of beauty, and when Venus saw her own temple forsaken and her shrines ungarlanded, she was so incensed at the insult 
that she vowed to punish poor Syke, who had been a most unwilling object of all this mistaken devotion. The goddess summoned her son Cupid to her presence, and bade him go slay the maiden who had presumed to be her rival in beauty. Believing that his mother's anger was entirely justified, Cupid was quite willing to kill the offending mortal with one of his poisoned arrows, and accordingly went in search of Psyche, who he found asleep in one of the rooms of her father's palace. It was night, and the moonlight shone through the open window, falling softly upon the couch where the maiden, unconscious of her doom, lay sleeping. One bright beam had lightly touched her forehead just as Cupid entered, and he saw with delight the loveliness that his mother had been eager to destroy. As he leaned nearer to the sleeping maiden, one of his arrows grazed his side, and unknowingly he himself was wounded. Not wishing to harm the beauty that he was now beginning to love, Cupid softly left the room and went back to Olympus. When Venus found that her rival was not dead, and that Cupid refused to hurt a thing so fair, she began to persecute poor Psyche until life grew unbearable for the helpless maiden, and she was determined to take her own life. So she stole secretly from the palace, and climbed up a high mountain where there was a ledge of rock overhanging a steep cliff. It was rather fearful to look down into the valley from the rocky ledge, and for a moment Sykes' heart failed her. But then she remembered the daily annoyances that Venus had inflicted upon her, and she remembered also the words of the oracle which said that her future husband was to be no mortal, but a monster whom neither gods nor men can resist. So, summoning all of her courage, she threw herself from the cliff, expecting to be dashed to pieces upon the rocks below. But Cupid had been watching over her, ever since she began her weary journey up the mountain, and when he realized what she meant to do, he commanded Zephyros to keep very near and to catch her lightly when she fell so it was not upon the cruel rocks that her soft body lay, but in the friendly arms of the west wind who bore her to a distant island, where Cupid had already made preparations for her arrival. On the thick grass, in the midst of a beautiful garden, Zephyrus laid his slight burden, and when Psyche opened her eyes, she found herself, completely unhurt, though bewildered by her strange journey through the air and by its unexpected ending. She rose from the grass and began to wander about the garden, wondering where she might be and what land lay beyond the blue water whose waves rolled lazily upon the beach that stretched far away for miles at the foot of the garden. Then she strolled further inland among the flowers, and soon came to a beautiful palace, whose doors were opened wide, as if to welcome her inside. Timidly she entered the stately hall, and saw before her a richly laden table and chair placed in readiness for the coming guest. Soon she heard voices speaking to her gently, and they bade her to eat, and to drink, for the feast was spread in her honour. Seeing no one, but reassured by the kindly voices, she ate the food so generously provided, and then she went again into the garden, but left it soon and hurried down to the sea, for when evening came on, she began to be lonely, and the silence of the garden grew oppressive. On the beach she heard the sound of lapping water, 
and she felt herself a part of the life that beats forever in the restless changing sea. At night she sought the palace, where these unseen servitors again ministered to her wants, and in the darkness Cupid came to her. He did not reveal his name, but he told how he had rescued her from death, and brought her to this very island that she might never again be persecuted by the jealous Venus. Everything that she wished for would be hers for the mere asking, and the invisible attendants would always be on hand to do her bidding. He himself would ever be her loyal lover, and would come each night to cheer her solitude. The only thing that he asked in return was that she should never seek to know his name or try to see his face. Psyche listened to the words of Cupid, and was won by the soft pleading of his voice, and thus she was content to stay on this unknown island, and to be with her unseen lover, whose name and face must forever remain a mystery. Many joyous weeks passed, and Psyche never wished to leave her new home, for though she was often lonely as she walked each day in the rose garden, she forgot the long hours of solitude when Cupid came at night to gladden her with his love and to tell her of all his wanderings. As time went on, Psyche began to wonder how things were faring in her father's palace, and she wished very much to see her sisters, who must have long since believed her to be dead. Cupid had told her she might ask for anything that she wished, save the two forbidden things, of course. So she summoned the west wind, and bade him to bring his sisters to her. Zephyrus gladly obeyed, and soon Psyche saw her two sisters standing before her, more astonished than she to find themselves there. For hours they talked together, and Psyche told them of her adventure on the mountain and how she had been rescued by the friendly west wind. She told them even of her mysterious lover, of his riches and great kindness, and regretted that she could not transcribe his appearance. But, she explained, this was impossible since she herself had never seen him. As the sisters listened to her story, their hearts were filled with bitter envy that she should be thus favoured above all other maidens, and they too plan to rob her of her happiness. And thus they reminded her of those terrible words of the oracle, that she should marry a monster, and under the pretense of a loving interest in her welfare, they urged her to break her promise to her lover, and to find out whether he was in truth a monster that was only waiting his time to devour her. At first she scorned these malicious suggestions, but by and by they began to make an impression on her already troubled mind, and she found herself ready to listen and eventually believe. Finally, she agreed to carry out the plan that her sisters arranged, which was to secrete a sharp knife in her room and use it to kill the monster as he slept. When Zephyrus had taken the sisters back to their home, and Psyche was once more alone, she felt ashamed of the promise she had made to them, but at the same time she could not forget the words of the oracle, nor cast off the suspicions that now filled her mind. She was anxious, too, to see her lover's face, and to be able to confront her sisters with the truth when they should taunt her again. So, that night, as Cupid was fast asleep, she softly rose, 
and by the light of a tiny lamp which she noiselessly lit, she groped for the knife with which she intended to slay the creature, who, her sisters assured her, was so frightful that he dared not show his face. Cautiously, she stepped to Cupid's side, and held over him the flickering lamp, but how astonished she was to behold, not an ugly monster as she had expected, but a slender youth, whose beauty was so great that she felt her heart beat fast with joy. Breathless she gazed at the unconscious form, and dared not move for fear of waking him. But as she bent adoringly over him, a drop of oil fell from her lamp on Cupid's shoulder, and he woke. For a moment he stared with startled eyes at the knife and lamp held in her trembling hands, and then he understood the meaning of it all, and that beautiful face grew sad. In a voice full of pity he spoke to the now remorseful Psyche, and told her that, as she had broken her promise, he must go far away from her, and never come again. In vain she wept and begged him to forgive her rash deed, confessing that it was her sisters who had tempted her to betray his trust. But Cupid gently freed himself from her clinging arms, and spreading his gauzy wings, flew out into the night. Psyche, still weeping, went down into the garden, hoping that love might relent and return in spite of his parting words, but as the hours passed she was still waiting, alone, and when the morning came it found her fast asleep, lying wet-eyed among the dew-laden flowers. When at last she awoke, it was midday, and looking around she found to her surprise that she was in a deep valley with mountains on all sides, and that the palace with its rose garden had vanished. All day she wandered in the valley, meeting no one who might direct her back home, and when at length she came to a stately marble temple, she was glad to enter it and rest though she did not know to whom the temple was dedicated. Psyche prayed to the gods for help, and Ceres, at last, whose altar she was kneeling, heard her, and in pity answered her prayers. She told the disheartened maiden that her lover was no other than Cupid, the god of love himself whom neither gods nor man can resist, and that if she wished to gain favor in the eyes of his mother, and thereby win her lover back, she would do well to seek the temple of Venus, and offer her services to the offended goddess. Psyche listened to these friendly words, and thanked Ceres for taking pity on her suffering. When she left the temple, she walked many miles through the valley, until she came to a shrine on which there were hung flowers, fruit, and jewels, which the suppliants of Venus bought as votive offerings. Before this shrine, Psyche knelt down humbly, and implored the goddess of beauty to accept her service and set her some task by which she could prove her fidelity. Venus was still angry at the memory of Psyche's former honours, and she was not to be placated by any prayers, however sincere they were. She accepted the maiden's service, but determined to torment her by setting impossible tasks. She brought her into a granary, where there were thousands of different kinds of seeds, all thrown into bewildering and unsorted heaps. Pointing to these, the goddess bade her to separate them all, and pile them together, so that by nightfall each seed should be in its proper place. Poor Psyche was in despair, 
at ever being able to tell one kind of seed from another. But Cupid, hearing her sighs, sent an army of ants who worked silently and swiftly at the enormous heap of seeds. Before twilight came, the work was done. When Venus saw this almost impossible task accomplished, she knew that Psyche had never done the work unaided. So, reproving her angrily for incompetence, she gave the maiden another commission, which was to gather some golden fleece from the sheep that were browsing in a meadow not far from the shrine. The next morning she set about her task, but as she neared the river that must be crossed before she should reach the meadow, the kindly reeds on the water's edge spoke to her, and they warned her of the danger she was about to encounter. They told her that the rams in the flock were so fierce that they would surely destroy her if she ventured at this hour among them, but that if she waited until noontide, when they grew drowsy and lay down on the grass beside the river, then she could cross in safety, and gather the bits of golden fleece which she would find caught on the bushes. She listened gratefully to this advice, and when the sun was high overhead, and the panting sheep were gathered by the river, lulled to sleep by the drowsy murmur of the reeds, she crossed the water fearlessly, and gathered up an armful of golden fleece from the bushes among which the flock had wandered. That night she delivered her precious burden to Venus, who again reproved her angrily. She knew fully well that it was only through Cupid's intervention that she had escaped the dangerous rams. So, the goddess then gave her a third errand, and bade her go down to gruesome Hades, to beg of Proserpina, Pluto's queen, a box of her magic ointment, which could restore all fading beauty to its former perfection. In the early morning, Syke set out on her journey, fearful of the dangers that lurked by the way, but eager to gain the favour of her hard-hearted mistress, so that she might thereby win her lover back. But when she had walked for many hours, not knowing where to find the entrance to remote and unsought Hades, a voice whispered softly in her ear, telling her of a certain cave through which she might enter the dreaded region of the dead. Then the voice directed her how to go unharmed past Cerebus, the three-headed dog, and how to persuade Charon, the silent ferryman, to row her across the black and swiftly flowing river. Encouraged by this timely help, Psyche was able to secure the desired box, and to come safely out of the dark country from which only the gods are privileged to return. As she trod wearily up the valley, back to the shrine of Venus, it occurred to her to take a little of the magic ointment for herself, for she knew that these days of waiting and working had dimmed the beauty that had once charmed Cupid's eyes. And so she opened the box, and out sprang the invincible spirit of sleep, who seized upon the poor unresisting Psyche and laid her apparently lifeless by the roadside. But Cupid was watching over his beloved through all the stages of her journey, and when he saw her unconscious on the ground, he flew quickly to her assistance, and fought with the masterful spirit of sleep until he conquered it, compelling it to return to the box from which it had been set free. Then he roused Psyche from her sudden sleep, and told her that her troubles were at an end, for henceforth he would always stay beside her 
Together they went up to bright Olympus, and stood before Jupiter's throne, where Cupid besought the gods to look upon with favour upon their love and to grant Psyche the gift of immortal life. To this great Jupiter gladly consented, and Venus, who was now ready to finally forgive her one-time rival, welcomed her as the fitting wife of Cupid. For Psyche is but another name for the soul, and the soul, to find its true happiness, must dwell forever with love. Echo and Narcissus Echo was a wood nymph, and a follower of Diana. She had the one fault of wanting to talk all the time, especially if she found someone who was willing to listen to her. One day Juno went down in great haste to the earth, suspecting that Jupiter was spending too much time in the society of the nymphs, but before she had gone very far into the forest, she met Echo, and stopped to speak to her. Now Echo knew that the ruler of the gods was happily engaged with the nymphs, and would not be pleased at his wife's sudden appearance, so she began to talk rapidly to Juno, and to tell her such entertaining stories that the unsuspicious goddess waited to listen. While Echo was thus keeping the jealous queen from seeking her husband, Jupiter warned her of coming, left the nymphs, and returned in haste to Olympus. When later on Juno learned that Echo had intentionally kept listening so that Jupiter could make his retreat unseen, she was so angry that with the officious nymph she forbade her ever to speak again, except to repeat the last word of any conversation she might hear. Thus, she could never more tell beguiling stories or interfere on behalf of Jupiter. At first, Echo was understandably quite miserable over this misfortune but in spite of it, she managed to spend her time happily in the forest, and to hunt with the other nymphs of Diana. One evening, as she stopped at a brookside to drink, she met a handsome young youth, who was named Narcissus, and at once fell in love with him. But unfortunately, she could not tell him of her affection, except by languishing looks and sighs. Narcissus was not at all pleased by her evident interest in him, for many maidens had loved him, and he had turned coldly from their advances, preferring to roam the forest alone. Some time later, Narcissus was hunting with a companion, and having rushed away in pursuit of a stag, he found his friend was no longer in sight. He called out to him, but no one answered except the devoted Echo, who was always dogging his footsteps. When Narcissus called, Are you here? Echo replied, Here. Come, cried the youth, and Echo answered, Come. Then she appeared before the young hunter and mutely begged for his love. But Narcissus scornfully turned to her, exclaiming, You shall never have me. Have me, cried the unhappy maiden, but her frank offer was repulsed, and the hard-hearted Narcissus turned away. Echo made no further attempt to win his love, but went into the mountains to live out her sad life all alone. No one ever saw her again, and in time she pined away and died, but her voice remained to whisper among the hills, and to give back the last word of any one who sought to call her. As for Narcissus, 
His scorn of love brought its just punishment, for Venus decreed that he should suffer even as poor Echo had done. One day, when he was hunting in a remote part of the forest, he came upon a beautiful deep pool, in which all objects were reflected as clearly as in a mirror. No wild things had ever come to drink of the cool stream. No feet of beasts had ever trampled the grass on its margin or muddied its pure waters. Not even a floating leaf had ruffled the calmness of its surface. When Narcissus knelt on the lush grass at the pool's edge and looked down into the clear water, he was surprised to see a beautiful face gazing up at him from the depth of the pool. He leaned nearer, and the face did not withdraw, but seemed to approach his own, and then he put out his arms to the water nymph, who he believed was returning his advances, and he was delighted to see two white arms stretched out as if to clasp him in their embrace but as soon as he attempted to grasp them, there was only the cool water in his hands, and the nymph had vanished. When the surface of the pool had grown clear again, and Narcissus leaned anxiously over it to see what had become of this baffling maiden, there she was still, gazing at him with her beautiful eyes. Again and again, Narcissus strove to embrace her, but she eluded his eager arms, and each time he clasped only the unsubstantial water. Maddened by these repeated defeats, he spoke reproachfully to the water nymph, and asked her why she thus tormented him. But though the lovely mouth so near his own seemed to move as if framing words, no answer came to his appeal. Each day Narcissus sought the forest pool, and each day he found the nymph ready to return his smiles and fond looks, but always escaping from his touch. By and by he spent all his time beside her, and cared for nothing else than to gaze beseechingly into the lovely eyes that looked into his own with the same fever of longing. Absorbed in the adoration of this strange being, who seemed so responsive to his passion, yet so unwilling to allow him near, he forgot to eat or sleep, and became only a shadow of his former self. The nymph, too, was pining away with hopeless love, for her face grew pale and thin, and the deep-shadowed eyes were full of sadness. Sometimes Narcissus slept from sheer exhaustion, but when the moonlight fell on the calm water, he would wake with a start and look anxiously to see if the water nymph was sharing his weary vigil. And always, he found her waiting there in the cool depths of the pool. Finally, he grew so sick with longing that he died of his hopeless love, without ever knowing that it was no water nymph whom he adored, but only his own reflection. The gods, believing that such devotion should not go unrecognized, changed him into a white flower which bears his name and this is usually found blooming beside some clear lake or tiny crystal pool. Pyramus and Tisbe In far-off Babylon there dwelt a youth and maiden whose families lived in adjoining houses with a party wall between the two estates. As the heads of these households were sworn enemies, in spite of their proximity, the wall was made high so that no one could climb over it, much less see what was on the other side. The maiden Thisbe 
as she walked in her garden, often wondered who it was whose feet she could hear pacing up and down along the wall. And one day, she was quite delighted to find a small crack in the masonry, which enabled her to peep into the adjoining garden. About this time, young Pyramus was planning some way to scale the wall, when he too discovered the same crack, and when he peered cautiously through it, he found to his great joy that there was a sweet faced maiden standing near, who hastened to assure him that she did not share in the family feud. The acquaintance soon ripened into friendship, and Pyramus and Thisbe spent many hours standing patiently by the crack in the wall, which was the only way in which they could exchange confidences. Soon, they began to grow dissatisfied with this meagre allowance of space in which to see each other, for by this time they had become so much in love that the tender whispers breathed through the broken wall only made them long to be together without this cruel barrier between them. So they planned to steal away from their watchful parents on a certain night, and meet just outside the city walls at Ninus's tomb, where a great white mulberry tree would hide them in its protecting shadow. Accordingly, at the appointed hour, the trembling Thisbe wrapped herself closely in her veil and crept out of the house. Finding that she had come first to the trysting place, she waited beneath the tree, and idly watched the moonlight shining on a broad pool that lay close to Ninus's tomb. Suddenly, a lioness stole out of the bushes, her mouth bloody with the recent gorging of oxen, and slunk down to the pool to drink. Thisbe, terrified at the sight of the creature's dripping jaws, fled into a nearby cave for refuge. But in her fright, she let fall her silken veil, and it dropped to the ground near the tree. The lioness, having drunk her fill, walked over to the tree and sniffed curiously at the bit of silk, and then worried at it a bit with her bloody teeth, as a dog plays with a rag. Just as the lioness departed, Pyramus came hurrying to the trysting place, and seeing Thisbe's torn and blood-stained veil and the print of the lioness's feet on the ground, he was beside himself with remorse and horror. Being certain that his beloved had been torn to pieces by some wild beast, he cursed his own carelessness in letting her come first to the spot so full of danger. And then he drew his sword, exclaiming that he no longer wished to live now that Thisbe was dead. He called upon the mulberry tree to bear witness to his oath of undying devotion, and then fell heroically down upon his sword, uttering the name of his beloved with his last breath. As blood gushed out upon the ground at the foot of the tree, the earth absorbed it so quickly that the white fruit of the tree turned a deep purple, and its juice became like drops of crimson blood. All this time, Thisbe was hiding safely in the cave, and when she at length ventured out, she gazed fearfully around to be sure that no lioness was lying in wait to devour her. When she reached the spot, she hoped to meet her lover. What was her terror and dismay to find him stretched dead upon the ground, with her veil held close to his parted lips? Realizing what had happened, and that it was too late now to convince him of his terrible mistake, she knelt down beside him, and vainly strove to bring him back to life. Finding this useless, 
she seized Pyramus' sword and plunged it into her heart, determined to die with him. As she sank forward on her lover's lifeless body, she prayed to the gods to have pity on her great love, and allowed her to be buried in the same tomb with her beloved Pyramus. The gods heard her dying prayer, and answered it by making their hard hearts of the parents relent so far that they consented to bury the lovers together. A costly tomb was erected over them as a fitting monument to these two unfortunates whom life so cruelly divided. Hero and Leander In the town of Cestus, on the Hellespont, lived a beautiful maiden named Hero, who was a priestess in the temple of Venus. Most of her time was spent in service of the goddess, but when these hours of attendance were over, she was free to leave the temple. Hero was glad to seek her own dwelling place, which was a lonely tower on the cliffs that overlooked the sea. Here she loved to sit, watching the white-winged gulls as they skimmed over the waves, or listening to the breakers as they dashed angrily against the rocks at the foot of the tower. The beauty of Hero was famed throughout the countryside, and many a youth sought the temple of Venus at festival time under the pretext of honouring the goddess. But really to gaze upon the lovely young priestess. Among the most eager to see the maiden was Leander, a youth who lived in a town just across the Hellespont and within sight of Hero's Tower. When he joined the solemn procession that came to do homage to Venus, he saw the beautiful priestess, and determined to win her in spite of the many restrictions that forbade even an acquaintance with one dedicated to the temple. Ignoring the thought of the inevitable punishment that would be meted out upon him if his rash presumption were known, Leander managed to find an opportunity to speak with Hero, and to tell her of his love. At first she would not listen to his pleading, but at last she was won over by the sincerity of his words, and consented to disregard her sacred vows by receiving him in her tower. Leander did not dare to visit her until nightfall and as he would have to swim across the Hellespont in the darkness, Hero promised to put a light on in her tower, so that he might have some beacon to guide him as he breasted the uncertain sea. When night came, and Leander stood impatiently on the shore, waiting for the promised signal, suddenly a torch blazed in the distance, and he knew that Hero was awaiting him, in her lonely tower. He plunged fearlessly into the waves, and though the current was swift, he struck out boldly, and was carried out of its dangerous grip. Now and then he looked up to where the light was still burning, and his heart beat fast with hope when he saw it grow larger and brighter as he neared the land. At last, he reached the rocks of the foot of the tower, and was soon standing beside the trembling hero, who had feared each moment to see him sink beneath the waves. The lovers were so happy being together that night, Leander swam across the treacherous sea, and Hero placed her torch in the tower to light him on his perilous journey. All summer they lived in this idyllic happiness together, but when winter came, with its storms and icy hand, Hero feared for her lover's safety, and begged him not to venture into the sea. Leander laughed, however, at her fears, and continued to brave the narrow stretch of water that lay between his home and her tower. The wind often beat him out of his path, 
and the icy water numbed his limbs. But he kept bravely on, with his eyes fixed upon the welcoming light. One morning a fierce storm broke over the sea, and increased in fury throughout the day, so that by night the waves were lashing themselves madly against the rocks, and the wind beat the seagulls back to land. Hero dreaded the approach of that hour when Leander would start on his nightly journey, for she knew that he would not hesitate to risk his life in the maddened sea for the sake of being beside her. When the time came for her to light the torch, she did so, reluctantly, hoping that Leander would not come. On the opposite shore stood the impatient lover, waiting for the accustomed signal. When it blazed out into the night, he plunged boldly into the waves. But now the sea was too strong, even for his experienced arms, and the huge waves tossed him about as though he were so much foam. The wind and rain beat upon his defenseless body, and the cold sea gripped him in its deadly embrace. He struggled bravely to make some headway, and called upon the gods for help, but his cries were drowned in the howling of the storm. His strength began to fail, as he fought desperately with the current, grown terrible in its swiftness. But now and then he lifted his head weakly above the waters to see whether Hero's torch was still burning. Just as he was making a last heroic effort to reach the land, a sudden gust of wind blew out the light. And seeing this, Leander, with a despairing cry, gave up his battle and sunk down into the sea. The next morning, when Hero, anxious and fearful, stood on the rocks at the foot of the tower, she saw Leander's body, which had been tossed there in wanton cruelty by the waves. Unable to endure this sight, and not wishing to live any longer now that her lover had perished, she threw herself into the sea, and when the fishermen came to launch their boats on the furious waves, they found the white-robed body of the young priestess lying dead beside her beloved Faithful Leander. Pygmalion and Galatia Pygmalion, the king of Cyprus, was a sworn bachelor, and had shunned the society of women for a great many years. But he was also a famous sculptor, and spent all his leisure hours carving wonderful things out of marble and ivory. Though he would not deign to admire any living woman, for he had lofty ideals of feminine beauty, and loved to carve statues whose perfection of form and exquisite grace surpassed any charms that could be claimed for a flesh-and-blood maiden, once Pygmalion made a beautiful ivory statue that was such a marvel of loveliness that even the sculptor himself became enamoured of it. And thus he lavished upon it a devotion that was hardly consistent with his supposed indifference to love. This perfect creation he called Galatia and he treated her with all the extravagant fondness that a lover bestows upon his mistress. He bought her presents of quaint seashells and delicately perfumed flowers, beads, pearls, and the rarest of jewels, and even gaily colored birds. Sometimes he hung a string of precious stones about her neck and draped her white body in softest silks treating her in every way as a maiden reluctant to be wooed. When the festival of Venus was being celebrated, Pygmalion joined in the procession and played a rich offering on the goddess's shrine. 
As he did so, he looked up towards high Olympus, and he prayed that Venus to grant him a wife like his peerless Galatea. The goddess heard his prayer, and as the patroness of all true lovers, she inclined with favour to do his wish. So when Pygmalion returned to his home and hastened into the presence of his adorned statue, he was bewildered at the change that seemed to be coming over it. A beam of sunset light was streaming in through the open window that had touched the ivory coldness of the statue and warmed it with a rosy glow that made it wonderfully soft and unyielding. But this was not all, for as the astonished sculptor stood wondering at this unexpected answer to his prayer, the beautiful face of Galatea turned toward him, and the perfect lips parted, as if to speak. Breathlessly, Pygmalion watched the statue gradually warming into life, and when he was at last assured that it was no longer a piece of unresponsive ivory, but a breathing, blushing maiden, he knelt adoringly at her feet and besought her to be his queen. Thank you very much for listening to part two of our stories of old Greece and Rome. I'd like to thank my top tier patrons, Brit, Charles, Stark Factory, JC, Jeffrey, Wendy, Tim, James, Aaron, Scott, Dark, and Ben. Thank you very much to you all. And I will see you in part three. May the gods be with you all. Good night, everyone.